Good afternoon. We're here to announce the dropping of the constitutional repeal amendment. This will give the states the state's rights that they anticipated they were getting in the Constitution, that they should have in the Constitution, but this will clarify how they can make use of it in the Constitution. Our founding fathers anticipated that there would be changes in the Constitution that would be necessary for changing times and to establish a process for amending Article 5. And it's been used uh, since 1789. There have been over 11,500 amendments that have been introduced to Congress. 33 of those were adopted and sent to the states for ratification, and 27 of those were ratified. We think this is one that will be through Congress and will be ratified and will give states a little bit more power. The way that it works is that if two-thirds of the state legislators pass a resolution, the same resolution, that they can repeal regulations and laws that we do. The main consideration is for regulation. Right now, we don't even have control over the regulation without going through a court process. They don't need to go through a court process. They can go through a legislative process, which can be a much faster process. And that way, unelected bureaucrats won't be able to impose things on the states that they feel is really their right, their need, and the will of the people that live in those states. So we're going to give some power back to the states. And uh, I think this will be a very popular, popular bill. I'll turn it over to Representative Bishop. Thank you, Senator Enzi. We're very happy that on both houses we will drop this particular bill today. Uh, you know, there's not one good reason for this repeal amendment. There's actually 14 trillion good reasons for this repeal amendment. If one looks at the $14 trillion debt that we have today, it is in large measure simply because the check and balance system that was originally supposed to be there, not just horizontally between the three branches of government, but also between the executive or between the national government level and the state government level, has been changed out of balance. There are many people today who revolt against the regulations and controls that are put upon them because truly this state, this nation is too big for a one size fits all system. Like in the House chamber, if you go in there and look on the top, they have all the icons of the great lawgivers of the world, and only two of them are Americans, Jefferson and Mason. It's ironic that neither of them actually signed the Constitution. And George Mason was one of three people who spent the entire time at the Constitutional Convention and then refused to affix his signature at the end of it. Now, when I was teaching school, I always insist my kids had to tell me, why did Mason not sign the Constitution? And of course, it was because it did not have a Bill of Rights. I was always hoping that some bright student would ask what I think is a more significant question. It was in vain because they never did. But it is not why did Mason not sign it, it is why did all those other great men at the Constitutional Convention not go along with Mason. It was certainly not that they were opposed to individual liberties. It was that they had another, more effective way of controlling it rather than making a list of what the government could or could not do. And that was the structure of government that divided powers into a check and balance system. So horizontally between the three branches, but vertically between the national and the state. The last six decades, that national and state balance of power has been significantly eroded and unfortunately eroded. This repeal amendment, and I, I appreciate Dr. Randy Barnett, who is one of the, the intellectual sponsors of this one, this repeal amendment brings that back into balance. It does not take power from the federal government, but it allows the states to ask the federal government at some time, if they think the federal government is wrong, to rethink the issue. There are some people who may talk about this as a state's rights issue or a nullification process or, or make references to the Civil War. If they do so, they are too shallow in their looking at what this is about. This is not about taking power away from the federal government. The federal government still has the ultimate say. It's about putting another player in there that can ask the federal government to rethink the issue. It's another check, another balance in the system. There is one criticism that I want to mention very quickly because it's legitimate. You could come up with 32 states which have the smallest population and only have 32% of the nation represented by their action. That is true that that could happen. But I want to continue, those 32 states are not found in one region. And if indeed you could get Vermont and Rhode Island and Arkansas and Iowa and Wyoming and Utah and Hawaii all to agree on something, 
that something is wrong, the chances are something is wrong. In fact, if you can get two-thirds of the states to think that any policy decision has a problem, the chances are there is a problem, and it needs to be rethought in that particular process. Thirteen states have already introduced resolutions in support of this. We are working with groups like the American Legislative Exchange Council to try and work with this. I am grateful for the sponsors who have signed on to this in the Senate. There are 14 sponsors who have signed on to this in the House. And if I could break the protocol right here, we're in the middle of a vote in the House. So if I could ask two of the sponsors that are dealing with this from the House so they can then be excused to go back there. Uh, Representative Paul Brown from Georgia, I appreciate having a Southern influence in here, and also Representative uh, Parker Griffin from Virginia. It's significant because Virginia was probably one of the leaders in presenting this particular approach. So if you'd like to like, take one second, and then we'd like the senators to take, take place at the rightful place at the podium again. Uh -huh. Paul? Well, I thank the senators for allowing us to speak. Um, we have to, in some mechanism, find a way to return to the original intent of our founding fathers which means very limited government. And this is a very good bridge to try to send those powers back to the people. The federal government was established supposedly to govern at the consent of the people, and it's not doing that anymore. In fact, the people are being governed by the consent of the governing instead of the opposite. And this amendment hopefully will be passed into law, placed into the Constitution, will reestablish that vertical check and balance. I hear all the time up here in Washington people say that the U.S. Supreme Court is the final arbiter of the Constitution, and I hold that that's absolutely false. The final arbiter of the Constitution is the Constitution itself and what our Founding Fathers said about it. And they meant very strongly that the states had a say. The states have a say through this amendment process to tell us here in Washington whether we're doing the right things or not. And a good example is if the states had their say, I don't think we would have Obamacare today, which is going to destroy our economy, it's going to destroy the health care system. I'm a physician and I know exactly the tact that Obamacare is going to place upon us. But that's one of many examples. We've got to empower the states to have a check and balance upon the federal government when here in Washington, we go overboard, out of bounds, and do things that we should not be doing in an unconstitutional manner. So I'm a very ardent supporter of this amendment. I encourage the American people to get behind it. Encourage your senators as well as your congressmen to sign on to this bill. Let's get it passed into law. Let's start putting government back the way it should be, according to our founding fathers' ideas. Thank you all very much. This time last year, I served as the majority leader in the Virginia House of Delegates, and in that capacity, we saw many things that we thought the federal government was stepping into that probably belonged to the states. This is an opportunity with this bill for us to, to have the states, if you get that super majority of the states in agreement on one concept, which I submit would be very difficult to do. But when that occurs, you can b pretty much bet that the federal government has really stepped into something that doesn't belong to them or has created a rule that is so onerous on the states that they cannot abide by it. You're not going to see it used very often, but as you've heard these other gentlemen say, it is a mechanism that the states need in order to preserve our federal system. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over and go vote. Thank you. Senator Hatch, the ranking member on finance. Well, thank you. Now, uh, I, I'm really honored to be here with these uh, fine members of Congress, including our senators as well. I, I might add, for too long, Washington has taken greater control over all of our people's lives. We have bureaucrats issuing res regulations that have far-reaching consequences. We've w witnessed literally thousands of regulations that kill jobs, hurt our economic competitiveness, and, and uh, put fundamental decisions that families should be making in the hands of Washington bureaucrats and regulators. The EPA, EPA, for instance, is trying to implement cap and trade through regulation. They couldn't get it through the Congress of the United States, now they're going to try and do it by regulation. The NLRB, or the National Labor Relations Board, is working to impose card check on American businesses through regulation. We probably noticed uh, the recent decision with regard to Boeing, trying to force a company to only deal with the uh, uh, union states rather than right-to-work states in their best interest. 
Uh, you could go further. The $2.6 trillion health care law uh, pushes billions of costs onto the states with a massive Medicaid expansion. Washington has even said no to the regular incandescent light bulb, of all things. In the West and in Utah in particular, this is a serious problem. In my state, Washington owns over 70 percent <coughs> of the land, and we can't do a doggone thing about it. We can't develop energy on it. We can't manage our own wildlife. Washington builds, quote, monuments, unquote, on federal land with no input from state or local officials. Enough is enough, in my opinion. It's time to fix this ridiculous situation where Washington thinks it knows best. That's why we're here today. This constitutional amendment would reset the balance between the federal government and the states. It would empower the states by giving them the means of overturning costly and burdensome federal regulations and requirements that have fun fundamentally, fundamentally altered our federal system of government. Providing states with a constitutionally protected way to remove the most egregious rules, regulations, and laws out of the books is just plain common sense. And I want to compliment our friends in the House and Senator Brasso for the work that they're doing on this. Well, as Ronald Reagan said, um, government isn't the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And, and that's why I'm so happy to be here with uh, Senator Enzi uh, from my home state of Wyoming and, and Rob Bishop from Utah. Uh, Rob is the chairman of the, of the House Western uh, Caucus for the Republicans, just as I am in the Senate. Uh, and the people of Wyoming and the people of Utah have, a, have an identical philosophy, which is the approach to Washington of just leave us alone. Leave our air alone, our water, our land, leave our communities alone, leave our guns alone, leave us alone. Uh, Senator Enzi and I both had the privilege of serving in the Wyoming State Legislature, and we know what it means to have state control, and we know what it means to have to live under rules and regulations, expensive rules and regulations coming from Washington. And that's why I'm so happy to be here today to stand with both of them and to support this piece of legislation and this amendment, uh, because I think it's what the American people really want. Give us our country back. Ronald Reagan used to also say, and I started with Reagan, I'll end with Reagan, he said, you can't be for big government and big taxes and big regulations and still be for the little guy. And I will just tell you, we are all for the little guy. Thank you. Well, I want to particularly thank uh, Congressman Bishop for his steadfast work on this and uh, excellent leadership. And because of him, I think that we probably will get this done this time. So I guess we can open it up for questions. Given that uh, the repeal amendment would allow states to protect their citizens from overreaching federal power, do you believe the Constitution and the Bill of Rights uh, sufficiently did not sufficiently limit federal power? I don't think that it specifically gave them a way to do it. This specifically gives them a, an entrance into the debate. And uh, there's definitely a need for the debate because uh, out our way, the EPA wants to manage manure piles and they want to make sure that farmers keep the dust on their own piece of property. They don't understand western wind. Uh, this is, from my standpoint, it's mostly about the regulations that are being passed that uh, don't appear to have a lot of constitutional backing and uh, in a lot of cases don't even have uh, congressional backing to do it. They're getting into a whole bunch of different areas and uh, I think that we'll get a, a, a very bipartisan approach from the states, particularly as many of them as have to uh, pass a, an identical resolution in order to rebring it to our attention and that will bring a lot of attention. If I could also add to that, it's very clear the Constitution was added with that concept of check and balance. Over the years, especially in the last 50, 60 years, the balance between the federal and the states has been eroded. That's what we're trying to reestablish here. So this isn't a regional thing. As, also, as Senator Enzi clearly said, it's also not a Republican or a Democrat idea. I mean, this can be used by conservatives, it can be used by liberals, but what it clearly says is the states have an ability, if they think they have been aggrieved, to ask Congress, ask the federal government, to rethink the issue. They, don't, they can't tell them what to do, but they have to ask them to rethink it. And what I think the practical reality will be is before Congress and maybe some of the agencies start acting as they have in the past, they may actually contact the states and get their input up front, which I think is a win-win situation for all of us.
Um, yes, I introduced it at the very end of, of last year's session in December just to get the, the discussion started. This time, we're actually working the issue. So really, this is the first introduction. No, I haven't talked to the speaker yet, Wh which he will obviously love this bill. Well, one, of, one of the reasons I think that it'll pass now is that in 2009 alone, there were 3,300 new rules and regulations. And that affected a lot of people in the United States. And there's a lot of adverse feedback from the states. They just want to know how they could have a little bit more input and actually get us to pay attention. Um, how do you plan to get Democrats on board with this? The, like I said, this is not a Democrat or Republican bill, even though you have Republicans so far. This is an idea that is there that can be used by Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives. It doesn't have a particular ideology to it. So I intend to, to make sure that the concept is there, and I think the concept will sell itself. Plus the fact that Senator Enzi is supporting it, it should be a slam dunk from here. But it's, it's going to be sold on its idea, and, and the fact that states themselves are pushing this as well uh, from their angle, the idea will be sold. It's not going to be power pushed by a political party. If, if this were to get focused at a particular issue or a particular regulation, it would have difficulty. But this is, the, this is a constitutional amendment. It's in rather broad language, and it requires a lot of work by states. If you figure that 34 states, which would be two-thirds, have to have an identical resolution to get us to reconsider, um, that, that's a lot of work. That's going to be bipartisan. I can't, uh, the states that were mentioned earlier, if they were just the low population states, that's a huge mix of, of red and blue states. Um, so it, it'll take a lot of people and a lot of action, but at least it gives them a way, and it's that hope that people have that they can have more input into their federal government. So just a clarification on this. Uh, if, if enough states had theoretically passed this under this uh, rule, if enough states had passed this resolution, it, the legislation or rule wouldn't automatically be appealed instantly. It would just simply go back to the con Congress to ask them to take another look at it? It would be repealed. It would be repealed immediately. Congress, yes. Congress, though, would have the ability then to go back and readdress the issue. If Congress wanted to go back and pass the same bill again, they have the, the power and ability to do this. All this is is asking them to rethink this position, take another look at it. And what do you say, uh, what's, sort of explain some of the differences, I guess, between uh, nullification and how is this not nullification in some the, the philosophy of nullification is that an individual state can declare an act of Congress or a policy null and void within that state. So North Dakota could say, for North Dakota, this law does not apply in North Dakota. That's nullification. This has nothing to do with this. All this is saying is that, as, as the senator said, two-thirds of the states have to get together, and two-thirds of the states have to agree on the same resolution, and then it goes to effect. And the states still don't tell Congress or the federal government what to do. They're just making it so that you change that you go back to ground zero and allow Congress or the federal government or the agencies to rethink the process and come up with another solution. Do you think a lot of supporters of uh, the repeal of the Seventeenth Amendment would be on board with this, and where is the support for this coming from? Um, this is this isn't the repeal of an amendment. This is an additional amendment, I know, but, and. Yeah, uh, I, I think the process for doing an amendment or repealing an amendment is exactly the same. This does not repeal amendments to the Constitution. This repeals regulations and laws that we pass and then gives us a chance to rethink them. I would assume that anyone who support this may have a particular item that they would like to see changed, but this bill per se isn't about a particular item. It's not one agenda. This is an overall process. And so somebody could be voting for this process because of some pet peeve they have. But don't limit it just to that. This is much, much broader. And this has to pass uh, both the House and the Senate with a two-thirds vote and then has to be ratified by three-fourths of the states, just like any other constitutional amendment. So it, it's a difficult process, but it will send a real message if that process is able to be done. It, it would be a resolution passed by the legislature. There may be some states that internally require the governor to participate in that. 
Uh, we're not changing whatever the states do on that process, but right. it would be a legislative resolution. Is the uh, is this uh, driven by to some extent by the uh, where the Tenth Amendment stands today and uh, sort of how it's uh, under law and Supreme Court rulings? The, the, the Tenth Amendment is essentially it isn't working and hasn't worked for decades. Do we need something else, or what are we looking at here? There is a constitutional provision right there today in the original uh, Bill of Rights that. Uh, it, it, it would, but the only redress that the states have is through the courts. And they're saying that's too long and too expensive a process. And this would speed the process up. I think a strict reading of the Tenth Amendment may have solved the process. But that has been, that has been eroded somewhat in practicality. This puts a practical approach back to the states from what they can do. And, and once again, you know, some other people have criticized this by saying there's already a way of attacking unconstitutional actions. What this is saying is whether it's an unconstitutional action or an extra constitutional, or even if it's allowed under the Constitution, if two thirds of the states thinks that this is a wrong headed policy, they have the ability to express that self and Congress has to rethink that. And I think that's a pretty high bar. I think as they rethink it, it will get the attention of Congress as well, whether they've got the, the 34 votes or not, 34 states or not. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.